Every time there is a discussion about deficits and general government debt in Europe, the cases of Italy and France are brought up as the problem, while at the same time Germany and Sweden are brought up as an example of allegedly robust and fair welfare states that somehow miraculously avoid deficits. In 2017, both left-wing and right-wing publications were mentioning Sweden as an example of a surprisingly thrifty administration because the shekels it manages to steal from its population through taxation are enough to run the government till January the 20th next year. In contrast, most governments of Europe effectively run out of money around late October or early November and then continue to function for 50 to 65 days on credit every single year. This is true and, of course, it's not sustainable. But is it really true about Sweden that it is the most fiscally responsible country in Europe? Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so this is a continuation of the discussion started on this channel more than two years ago when we had the 2017 Swedish tour during which we debunked several myths that way too many people believe about Sweden. And today we're going to look in great detail at one of the most pervasive myths about Sweden. The myth that you can have a gigantic welfare state and open borders and fiscal responsibility and continue to grow economically all just consequence free. Over the past five months or so, three people, well, four if you include me, have been documented the financial reality in the Swedish coffers and compiled a big enough dossier with stories from the local media that show quite a different reality. In other words, most of what I'm about to say is not a secret. It's just that the story has been told in bits and pieces inside Sweden and never touched on outside of Sweden or rarely touched upon, thus maintaining the illusion that Sweden is a paradise where money are essentially infinite and a country that proves that you can have open borders and a gigantic welfare state and an over-regulated economy and that it all can somehow work despite what sanity would dictate, especially if you can get away with calling sane people, well, Nazis. <laughs> so, for the purposes of this talk, this presentation is divided as follows. 1. Explaining the mythology, 2. Exploring the reality, 3. The authority's narrative when confronted with the said reality, 4. Identifying the truth about the causes, 5. The troubles in exposing the truth, Number 6. What's next or and then what, Number 7. Identifying potential remedies, and finally, Number 8. Conclusions. Now, this will get pretty long because I will insist on reading quite a few portions of the huge pile of links that's been gathered as research for this video, precisely because the reality is so outlandish that you wouldn't believe me if I were to just simply tell you how things are. You have to see it for yourself in the trusted sources. So, without further ado, chapter 1 explaining the mythology. Now, this is the easiest one. Basically, Sweden is cooking the books in order to hide the disaster. It's not the first country to do so. I mean, Greece did it for uh, did so for uh, decades. Spain still does it. Finland does it too. It's quite a European tradition to lie about your country's financials. The way the Swedish scheme works is as follows. Most of the really expensive programs are not legally the purview of the central government, but of the local authorities. 
The communes, as they are called in Swedish, are those that manage it. So, for instance, the central government mandates that the new Swedes, new Svenskarna, get housing, pocket money, language classes, and support in finding a job, not to mention free school, free care, uh, healthcare, or so on. The central government mandates all or most of this, but legally, the responsibility to pay for it lies with the city halls or towns or municipalities and cities. All of these coordinate, sort of, with the central government via the Sveriges Kommune och Landsting, or the SKL, or the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, a quasi-private collection of organizations, including a trade union, that includes only taxpayer-funded organizations. Now, if that si sounds insane to you, it's because it kind of is. The SKL is part of a compromise between the constitutional principle of local self-government and the impetus towards a big central government. So, SKL is basically the largest employer organization in Sweden, representing about 1 million people or 10% of the population, almost all of them employed in the public sector. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because SKL has most of the data we're interested in for the purpose of untangling the real financials of Sweden and not the sanitized version that Leuven keeps on presenting to the Riksdag and to Brussels and then most of the fools that populate those places end up believing and then spreading further the absolute lie that Sweden is a fiscally disciplined state. So, to sum up this point, most of Sweden's public expenditure is, from an accounting perspective, not in the books of the central government. As a result, the central government has a relatively easier job of keeping its books apparently balanced and pretend nothing is wrong. It's easy to balance the books when 0% of the welfare spending has to be accounted for by the Prime Minister and the central government, and that is in a welfare state. Such schemes are common in all areas of the Swedish economy. For instance, naive libertarians as well as boomer conservatives keep on regurgitating the lie that Sweden is a good place for doing business because it doesn't have a minimum wage. Oh, sure, technically that's true. In practice, however, multiple organizations, like the SCOIL, rigorously enforce a de facto minimum wage that make economic activity for those that don't have friends in high places essentially impossible. But anyway, I digress, that's a topic for another day. There's gonna have to be a huge video about Swedish corruption. The point is that the numbers you find in European Union statistics about the fiscal responsibility of Sweden are meaningless because they don't tell the whole story. In fact, they tell, at best, around 10% of the story. The rest of the story is in the local budgets and SKL reports, which, unsurprisingly, are never translated in English and rarely discussed in public to begin with. Still, about six months ago, the situation started to become so bad that slowly the SKL reports and the reality started to be discussed, albeit in hush-hush tones. In fact, two of the people who drew my attention to this topic ins insisted multiple times that I don't discuss their identities in the video because they could lose their jobs simply for sharing a link from the mainstream press with a politically incorrect person like me. But more on that in chapter 5. All right, chapter 2, exploring the reality. This is where we'll spend quite a lot of time. So, now that you know what the SKL is, let's read this nice title, uh, this nice little story from May this year from Sveriges Televihun. So, not Breitbart, not Sam Helsnut, not Nyheteri Dog, or any other far-right website that thrives on exposing the reality of Sweden, which, as we know, is a racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic, xenophobic, and especially Islamophobic thing to do. So, no, we're not going to read from those places. We'll be good citizens and read from the state media. So, uh, SVT, many municipalities and regions go into deficits. SKL recommends tax hikes, published on May 13th, 
2019. And it goes like this. Every third region and every fourth Swedish municipality went into deficit in 2018, according to figures from Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. So many municipalities being in the red hasn't happened since 2008. And now it may come to a point where both spending cuts and increased taxes will have to be implemented. Twice a year, the SKL releases their financial report with a forecast for the economy in regions and municipalities. On Monday came the latest forecast and based on what SVT has seen, these are bleak figures. 69 of the country's 290 municipalities were in deficit in 2018, thus every fourth municipality does have its finances together, the largest number since 2008. Six out of the 20 regions went into deficit, i.e. every third region. 16 of the country's regions shrank economically last year. The causes are declining economic activity and growing population. We have a high pressure from a growing population. The number of people over 80 is expected to increase by 47% over the next 10 years. We will also have a rapid increase in children and young people, while the working age population is slowly increasing by only 5% says SKL's chief economist uh, Amika Wollenskog. At the same time, the earlier good years of the boom with money being raised on land sales taxes and high tax revenues are coming to an end. Costs are expected to increase in the coming years. By 2022, municipalities and county councils will need 38 billion crude or more than today if nothing changes, if the same staff density is maintained and population changes continue. According to the government's agreement with the Centre Party and the Liberals, uh, state grants to municipalities should increase by 5 billion a year. But according to SKL, in that case, that's still 20 billion kroner short of what's needed with the increased costs that are expected. With this result, we expect that the tax rates will need to be increased by 13% and virtually all regions and municipalities are working on savings and efficiency improvements, says Annika Wallenskog. When should the taxes be raised? By 2020 at the latest, says The Economist. From SKL's point of view, it is pointed out that the state economy is good at the same time and does not quite unexpectedly want several general government con uh, contributions. We see that this is not the municipal sector itself. It is a joint responsibility between the state and the municipality, says Annika Wallenskog. Close quote. So, are we clear? The worst situation since 2008, and that's without a recession actually happening. Now sure, a recession is coming from Germany, but this article was published in May when recession was a far-right conspiracy, and the numbers are for 2018 when there was not even a beginning of a recession anywhere in Europe. Also, the troubles did not start in 2018. In fact, in 2018, it was already clear for those who knew where to look that the country of Sweden was effectively bankrupt already. Here's a story from December 2018 from Aftonbladet, again, a publication associated with the Swedish Social Democratic Party. Hardly a capitalist right-wing rank that wants to ruin the good name of Swedish leftism. And certainly not a Russian operation seeking to sow discontent, which is usually the excuse of most Swedish leftists when you point out reality to them. So, uh, Aftonbladet, Skandia, 19 of the country's 21 regions are bankrupt. Now, keep in mind, Skandia is one of Europe's oldest life insurance and private pension firms. Again, not a far-right Russian-funded conspiracy. So, uh, Aftonbladet, quote, by Scandia's standards, hidden pension liabilities mean that 19 regions in Sweden are already bankrupt, according to a new report from the pension company. The debt is immensely large and it will be evident for many county councils when fewer people will provide more, at the same time as pension debts must be paid, comments uh, Gregor Gustafsson, business manager for public affairs at Scandia. Uh, Vesta Jotaland is one of the regions designated as bankrupt. The debt here amounts to 40 billion kroner due to the gap between tax revenue and costs in the county council's budget. 
this in turn has to do with the changing demographics, with an increasing number of older and younger citizens. According to Scandia, there are two ways for the crisis county councils uh, in the county councils. Either assets must be sold or the county council taxes must be increased. Otherwise, there is a risk of being forced to cut into healthcare and welfare, writes Jotebos Posten. The pension debt is the total debt for pensions that the county has to uh, pay to its employees. It is therefore the money that everyone, uh, every employee has the right to receive in the form of an occupational pension. According to the report, the county council's uh, uh, total pension liabilities amount to just over 244 billion kroner, which corresponds to the salary cost of 50,000 nurses over a 10-year period. The largest pension debt per inhabitant is uh, in uh, Westerbotten County with 34,737 kroner per inhabitant, says Sisson. Close quote. So, Americans watching this video or listening to this video may recognize the landscape. This is Detroit, essentially. Unproductive demographics, unfunded pension liabilities, high taxes, high regulation, incompetent governance, basically Detroit. Except Sweden doesn't have a federal government to run towards for help, nor does it have a relevant printing press. The federal government can print more dollars and spread out the burden to the whole world, really. Sweden, on the other hand, it may be a humanitarian superpower, <laughs> but I sincerely doubt anyone will care once the consequences for this mess will become apparent, and they will. But more on that in chapter 6. Until then, let's continue to explore the reality a bit more, because this is quite fascinating. Again, all of this has been told in the very mainstream Swedish media, but for some reason nobody spent the time to put the stories together. They were presented as isolated stories, uh, one or two months between them, thus fueling the impression that most Swedes already tend to have, namely that when something terrible happens explicitly because of government corruption and incompetence, that something must be an isolated case. Because Swedes are a thoroughly demoralized population in the way Yuri Bezmenov described demoralized individuals. You can bury them in facts and the vast majority of them will never believe you. Anyway, the decline in local finances is systemic and not an isolated incident. Even the regions which haven't yet gone into deficits and aren't yet in the bankrupt category are also rapidly slowing down. Take this story also from SVT from uh, June the 12th, 2019. The Stockholm region faces a multi-million loss. The Stockholm region will return the surplus of 630 million kroner this year if nothing is done. Now healthcare needs to reduce its costs on everything from medicine to uh, spaces or premises costs. The Stockholm region, which is responsible for the whole county's uh, healthcare, made a re record surplus of almost 2.2 billion kroner last year. This year, the region will instead close the year with 630 million kroner if nothing is done, a new economic forecast shows. The costs of hiring staff for healthcare have increased. In addition, more citizens have needed medical care, says Irin uh, Svenonius from the Moderate Party, who is the regional uh, financial councilwoman. The in, in particular, Karolinska University Hospital, Danderid and Södersjukhuset are expected to suffer large deficits cutbacks are needed. Everyone has to review their costs for hired staff, consumables, medicines, premises and administration, says Irin Svenonius. Södertele Hospital is the only large healthcare facility in the country that has managed to reduce the cost of hired staff. I'm absolutely convinced that this is about a different leadership where the responsibility is delegated so that the staff can take part and make decisions on issues uh, related to the business. It creates a positive spiral, says Irene, uh, Irene Svenonius, close quote. Well, what uh, Irene Svenonius says is simply corporate speak, nothing whatsoever to do with reality. In reality, the reason Södertele has been able to reduce some of its costs is because half of the population of Södertele commune is immigrant of the religion of peace variety. Uh, 
which means that they don't go to their local hospital, but to those that are more top tier because hey, why not? It's not like they're paying for it. Also, of the big cities in Sweden, at least Stockholm is still in the black. Not by much and likely will not be at the end of 2020, but for now it's still not running deficits. You know who else does? Everyone else. The other two big cities, Malmö and Göteborg, have been living off the state handouts and money rerouted from other municipalities for years now. Here's the story uh, from Sydsvenskan from October 2018, where representatives of the uh, Ferreter Garna, the largest entrepreneurial organization in Sweden, keep on insisting that Malmö is economically sick, and this has been going on for quite some time. Now, that was a year ago. Things are worse now. Here's what uh, Magnus Inson Engelbeck uh, was writing uh, one year ago. Quote, Malmö is said to be the engine of economic growth in southern Sweden, but the city is in fact a black hole for the national treasury. Malmö is the municipality in Sweden that receives the largest contribution through the equalization system, just over 5 billion kroner in 2018. This is more than twice the amount that the second most dependent municipality, Göteborg, receives. The fact that the city of Malmö receives 15,000 kroner per inhabitant from other municipalities is an unreal reasonable anomaly. The municipal equalization system was never intended to make a contribution to metropolitan municipalities with good conditions. Instead, the system would, was made to ensure that people throughout Sweden receive good service, even in smaller rural municipalities. Therefore, it is regrettable that the cost equalization investigation these days presented proposals that only adjust and not redo the equalization system. Malmö's official explanation is that the unusually high equalization contribution is due to residents' income and thus the municipality's tax revenue is low compared to the rest of the country. That the tax base is low, that is indeed true. Our report on entrepreneurship in Swedish municipalities shows that the employment rate in Malmö is the lowest of all 290 localities. Unemployment in the city of Malmö is 15%, more than twice the national average. The municipal equalization system means that the city can overshadow the need to increase the opportunities for those who today lack livelihood by working. Since 1990, four out of five jobs have been created in companies with fewer than 50 employees. The fact that Malmö is so significantly behind in the employment rate can largely be explained by a less favorable business climate. Malmö's political leadership has simply not given the companies the same conditions to hire and expand as in the rest of Sweden. Malmö's pitiful situation cannot be blamed on the fact that other municipalities work better. On the contrary, Malmö should learn lessons from what those municipalities are doing right. Most people understand that it is not sustainable in the long term to have a quarter of their expenses financed with grants. This applies to all businesses and to all individuals. It is impossible to survive on its assets. And raising taxes is not sustainable in the long term. It drives productive and uh, enterprising residents from the municipality and further deteriorates the situation for the city. But Malmö's current political leadership believes that it can do nothing to ensure that local residents receive higher incomes and continues to expect the central government to contribute with 25% of the municipality's budget. This cannot go on. Close quote. Now here it mentions uh, um, all sorts of statistics, but it doesn't mention means uh, some other facts. Incidentally, Malmö is the host of a Salafist mosque built with money from Qatar. It is also home for the largest immigrant area in Sweden, Rosengård, where about 90% of the residents are of immigrant background, as the politically correct language would have it, and also home to more grenade attacks per year than any Brazilian favela. Maybe that has something to do with it. No? No, no, of course not. It, it can't be. No, it has to be uh, the unemployment statistics, of course. Of course, the subject is still somewhat ignored, and it is still not the main topic on the agenda in Sweden, even though it should be. Back in August, finally, even Dagens Nyheter, the mainstream publication that avoided the topic like plague, 
reported that this year 110 municipalities will be in the deficit. That's 110 out of 290, and it includes all the big cities except Stockholm. Keep in mind that even the communes that are de facto in Stockholm, but de jure separate municipalities, are also running up deficits. One such uh, example is uh, Södermanland, or Sörmland, uh, as the locals are calling it. The local paper, uh, paper from Sörmland reported back in May that the county will rack up at least 20 million kroner in deficits this year. And this is an area where rich people live who pay a crap ton of taxes. But as always with any socialist regime, no amount of money is enough. We could go on like this with municipality after municipality. I have about 50 such links from the last 15 months documenting the slow realization of even the mainstream media that this simply cannot go on. Now, is this a surprise? Not to anyone with a brain, no, it isn't. If you go back in, seven, in 2017 on this channel, we had these conversations with people involved in this mess. Anneli Hoiber, who is a teacher herself, explained in the interview with me that the spending in education is out of control and that immigration and ideologization will necessarily lead to either bankruptcy or severe cuts. Nobody listened, nobody cared. Fast forward to the current year, October the 8th, 2019, Sveriges Radio, again a state media enterprise, not a far-right blog, spending cuts in primary schools in many municipalities. Quote, half of the country's municipalities have made cuts within the school budgets this year, and in every fourth Swedish municipality there have been fewer staff per pupil. This shows a survey conducted by Sveriges Radio. It's tough. We've had efficiency requirements on us now since 2018, totaling around 20 million kroner. And it is clear that it affects our business, uh, says Tommy Falk, head of uh, school in uh, Sveljungo. Many municipalities uh, throughout the country have been protesting against austerity measures within the school during the year, and Sveriges Radio survey of administrative heads with responsibility for compulsory school confirms the picture that 2019 has been a tough year for schools in many places. The school principals in 262 of the country's 290 municipalities have answered the questionnaire, which means a response rate of 90%. It's just over half of the country's municipalities, 151 each, where the compulsory school has had to, be, uh, has had to have implemented austerity measures on this year the survey shows. And in more than one in four Swedish municipalities, savings have meant a reduction in staff in relation to the number of, sweet, uh, of students. Despite all these savings, the school principals in half of the municipalities in our survey estimate that their schools will still not be able to keep uh, a balanced budget this year. In 2019, we now have to find another 6 million kroner to save up, and, and the end of 2019 is coming, says Lena Hallquist, head of education administration in Lusdal. And if 2019 has been a tough year for the schools, 2020 will be even tougher. Three out of school, uh, three out of four school principals resp that responded in the survey say that it is even uh, very likely or quite likely that they will have to make even more savings within their primary schools next year. And every other school principal estimates that the savings will mean a reduction in the number of employees per student. Close quote. Sweden, yes! <laughs> and on and on like that it goes. In Strömsund i Jämtland, the local authorities try to quite literally take money away from retirees, from old people to handle their budgetary situation. For now, the proposal was voted down, but the vote was, was held and it was tight. And will it be voted down again in the future? Very likely not, given that at best the locality will be at least 15 million kroner in the hole in 2020. And that's a best case scenario. And keep in mind that it's the local authorities' forecast. But as we've seen in other localities, such as uh, uh, Dalarna in the following municipality, local forecasts can be incredibly wrong. The authorities in Dalarna expected a 70 million kroner surplus, but as it turns out, instead they will have to deal with a 6 million kroner 
deficit. And that's in a city that is not uh, vibrant and has very little diversity, progress, uh, enrichment and youths. And on and on like that it goes. So this is the reality. If this reality had been included in financial reports presented in international context, Sweden would no longer rank as number one most fiscally responsible country, but rather somewhere lower than Italy and only slightly above France, if I did my maths correctly. In any event, it would definitely rank somewhere in the cohort of, of the most fiscally irresponsible countries of Europe. That's for sure. So how did this happen? That's what we're going to look at in chapter 3, the authorities' narrative when confronted with the reality. So, back in 15, 16, and even 17, the very existence of this problem was ignored, and anyone bringing it up was quickly branded as a racist, sexist, xenophobe, and the debate thoroughly suppressed. Because you see, numbers are bigoted. The problem is that you can't kick the can down the road for too long. Eventually, the truth does come out, especially in a game of numbers and money. Sure, Sweden's scheme is good enough to make sure the truth will stay suppressed for a bit longer outside the country and for those not aware of how Sweden really works, but for the local authorities and the accountants working day to day on this, the truth eventually had to be said in public. And as you've noticed from the stories that I translated for you, the reaction was to blame three things. Sluggish economic growth, old people, and a mysterious increase in young people. So let's look into each of them. Let's start with the sluggish economic growth. Well, whose fault is that? <laughs> I mean, it's, like, it's not like there is an European patriarchal council which gets to decide that in the middle of an economic boom, uh, Sweden will be forcibly assigned in the sluggish economic growth category as punishment for uh, its uh, far-left lunacy. No, no, sluggish economic growth during an economic boom is a self-inflicted wound. And it's done via insane policies, uh, policies, such as unionization, gigantic taxes, excessive interference by the government in the business environment, either in the hiring process via feminist-inspired lunacy, or in the, process, uh, in the production process via eco-Marxist-inspired lunacy. I mean, Greta Thunberg is, after all, from Sweden, though her handlers are German, but that's a topic for another day as well. So to the extent that sluggish economic growth is to be blamed, that falls squarely on the elected officials. Sure, sometimes that can be the fault of external forces too. For instance, it is not the fault of Swedish officials that Germany will fuck up all of Europe's economies during 2020, and especially 2021. But for the last four years, everyone had a good time with the economy. So if Sweden has not, the problem surely resides in Sweden and not in external factors. The second narrative invoked by the authorities is old people. This comes as a result of the general feeling among Sweden's uh, elite class, which is one of disdain, if not outright hatred, for elderly Swedes who built the wealth that these commies are now uh, done squandering. One of the reasons for this disdain is because older people tend to be not just skeptical, but outright opposed to the radical social engineering that the Swedish elite has embarked on since the 1980s and accelerated after the year 20, uh, 2002 and until present day. Here's a graph published by Hanif Bali, member of the parliament with the mainstream conservative party Moderaterna. He tweeted the graph with the uh, sarcastic comment, don't forget it's the aging population that is driving the welfare deficits. Now, for those who don't speak Swedish, the graph is titled Demographic Change Between 2002 and 2008, uh, sourced the Swedish Statistics Central Bureau, with blue is uh, uh, Inrikes background, or domestic background, so Swedes, and with red is Utrikes background, or immigrant background. On the first column, it is the age group from 0 to 100, and on the second column, it is the age group from 75 to 100. The graph is 
pretty self-explanatory. The number of old people has not increased more than the number of younger people. Even if you take only Swedes and exclude immigrants, once you include immigrants too, the image is totally lopsided, as the graph clearly shows. Translation. No, the aging population has nothing whatsoever to do with this. Immigration does have something to do with it, clearly, but more on that uh, in the next chapter. So, uh, finally, the third reason invoked by the authorities as part of the official narrative uh, is the increase in the number of young people who, as the narrative goes, don't work and consume welfare funds in numbers and proportions that didn't used to happen before. Now, that's a weird way of saying, um, um, well, mass immigration, but I digress. So, uh, the trouble is that blaming this on young people is kind of disingenuous, given that Sweden still has one of the most active young populations in the developed world. Young Swedes usually leave their parents' homes faster than anyone else in Europe. They get their first job on average faster and usually become productive a bit faster. This has consistently been the case for the last 20 years now, and from what I gather, even significant proportions of children from immigrant families tend to follow the pattern. Sure, not all, not exactly the same, but on this issue alone, even children of an immigrant background are closer to the Swedish standard. So, no dice on this either. Basically, the elite class continues to lie and obfuscate. They can no longer avoid publishing the real numbers, thus giving a more honest picture of the proportion of the disaster, but they can still lie about the causes, because why not? <laughs> they, can, uh, they can rely that the obedient Swedish population will believe it. And why wouldn't they think that? The Swedes have proven time and time again that they're willing to believe anything if the state says it. Sure, not all of them and not always, but the elite class has already learned and internalized the rule that you can't fool all the people all the time and has mastered the art of fooling some of the people all of the time. So what is the truth? Well, it's a bit more complicated, which is why it gets its own chapter. Chapter 4, identifying the truth about the causes. So, most commentators have focused on immigration, and for good reason. One of the facets of the truth is indeed mass immigration. In some areas, things have gotten so bad that even Labour and far-left politicians have started to speak out. For instance, in Philipstad, a municipality in Värmland, the politicians have already announced that they will file for bankruptcy. Philipstad has even been the subject of an SVT documentary. The SVT expected to meet local authorities who are as progressive as they are, given that they belonged to the same left-wing coalition. Surprise! even local lefties are fed up. Here's a story from Expressen back in April, uh, before the locality was profiled in a documentary. Expressen titled, uh, Who will hear the emergency call from Philipstad? It's a long article and I won't read it all, but this passage is relevant. Quote, Philipstad municipality is typical of the depopulation in Sweden that has come to play a central role in the Swedish refugee reception. Since the 1990s, the city has received a large number of asylum seekers. For a long time, it worked well, says Commander uh, Klaas Hultgren to me. Uh, as soon as the refugees had obtained the residence permit, they moved on to other parts of Sweden where the jobs were. But as the refugee reception began to move away in the autumn of 2012, that pattern gradually changed. There were no longer any vacant houses to move to in the big cities, and the newly arrived people stayed in Philipstad, or rather, the low-skilled remained. Newcomers with a high level of education have to a large extent continued to move away from the locality. Even the major change in the migration policy, even after the major change in migration policy, the influx has continued. The consequence has been that social costs are rising. Philipstad has the highest rate of social grants in the whole country in relation to the population. Of the a bit over 10,000 of the city's inhabitants, 
2,000 of them have an overseas background. And here, I will stress that the author uses the uh, terminology Utomeuropeisk background, or non-European background, which is a term that used to be absolutely haram to use just four years ago. You'd instantly be fired and called a racist. But now, even lefties had to admit, uh, have to admit that not all immigrant backgrounds are really equal. Anyway, back to the article. As many as 80% of the odd adults in that group lack jobs and another 10% of them are in labor market policy measures, according to the mayor. Now, again, here I have to stress uh, that labor market policy measures is the literal uh, uh, translation of Arbeitsmarktnatspolitiska Utjärder, which is basically, how should I put this, a program of creating make-believe or pretend jobs paid for by the taxpayers. It, it's a scam, really. But that's basically what they, what they mean when they, uh, when they say um, labor market policy measures. So basically, they are hiding some of the immigrant unemployment. Back to the article. And it's not just the welfare that weighs on the municipality's finances. Philipstad also has very high placement costs for children who are ill. When the costs are summed up, the figure reaches to over 60 million kroner. For a small municipality like Philipstad, that's a lot. Klaes Hultgren urges Stockholmers to multiply the cost by 100 to understand the financial challenge that Philipstad is facing. We can't handle this financially. We must submit our bank bankruptcy application, says Klaes Hultgren. Now, skipping quite a bit, going towards the end of the article, the state's escape from responsibility is provocative. It is not the municipalities such as Philipstad that have decided that Sweden should be the most generous country in the West, but it is the poorest municipalities that have had to pull the heaviest load. It is possible to object to the fraudulent extra services as well as Delmos and the employment services, but it is not only possible to pull off the carpet uh, from under uh, vulnerable municipalities without any impact assessment. How will Philipstad survive economically and socially? Someone in Rosenbad should have an answer to that question." Close quote. Now, a side note here, when the author says someone in Rosenbad should answer, uh, she means the Swedish government. Rosenbad is the name of the building. Just like in Britain, the press sometimes says Downing Street has to answer for this or that. It's the same mechanism. But yeah, the article basically tells you what I told you in the opening chapter. The central government made a series of decisions and then moved the costs from its own books to the local authorities. That way, the central government can continue to LARP as a humanitarian superpower on the international stage, while poor people in Sweden get to be viciously raped, both physically and metaphorically via sluggish and expensive services paid through gigantic tax rates that no mentally sane person should ever consider fair. And on this point, I should add that for a while, the central government did pay for some of this. We knew this in, uh, since 2015, but it wasn't made public until about a year ago. And it's still hush-hush information in the sense that it is never emphasized, although now it is publicly available and one doesn't need to go through a detective work process to find it out. Take, for instance, this story from uh, SVT. Uh, Wilhelmina goes into deficit even more. 40 million kroner must be saved. Quote, there is an economic crisis in several inland municipalities in the country. In Wilhelmina, the municipality must now save 40 million kroner in a couple of years. Dismissals and reductions are what awaits. Just a few weeks ago, the deficit uh, in uh, Wilhelmina was 38 million kroner, but when the figures were recalculated, it added just over 2 million extra. We recalculated the figures properly, and unfortunately, there was an additional 2.3 million that must be saved, says the municip municipal council member Annika Andersson from the Center Party in Wilhelmina. She believes that it is tough for several inland municipalities with declining population and lower tax revenue. But last year's disaster results are largely due to reduced support from the Swedish Migration Board, according to Annika Andersson, close quote, and there you have it. Most of these municipalities 
got a lot of payments from Migrationsverket or the Swedish Migration Board in order to pay for the loads of immigrants. The payments stopped, but the immigrants are still there and they still need welfare. Now, who's going to pay for that? The reality is that nobody will pay for that eventually. Without mass deportation, Norway and Denmark style at the very least, this is an unassailable situation. Now, Keep in mind that the municipalities are not without fault here. They're not the victims of an irresponsible central government. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, the local authorities were in on the scheme for the most part. Take for instance uh, Avesta in Dalarna, whose uh, politicians were thrilled back in 2016 on how their locality will get financially rich on the backs of the immigrants. The local politicians were already planning on how to spend hundreds of millions of kroner in shinier offices, higher salaries, more gender quota employees, and so on and so forth. Also vide, as the Swedes would say. And that was in 2016. Fast forward to present day and parts of the city are, the way a friend of mine described, a cockroach infested criminal slum. A shithole, essentially. I'll leave more links in the low bar with that story for you to read because I can't read them all because otherwise we'll be here for the whole day. <laughs> anyway, the point is that while some of this is indeed connected to mass immigration, it is not just mass immigration that led to the bankruptcy of the country. Or let me put it another way. Mass immigration has accelerated what was already going to happen anyway. Because besides mass immigration, Sweden has two other problems that predate the 2015 migrant crisis socialism and corruption. The two go hand in hand, of course, but in Sweden, nobody even wants to consider that such thing as mass corruption in the administration might indeed be a thing. Here in the Interbarium, as well as in Italy, Ireland, and even France lately, we at least acknowledge that we have a corruption problem, particularly in the Three Seas Initiative. We set up institutions and civil society watchdogs in, a, in an effort to curb the corruption in the administration. Now, do those efforts always work? No, of course not, uh, be, but they sure do have an impact. Corrupt officials are a lot more wary today than 20 years ago of getting into various schemes against the taxpayers. Uh, mayors and even prime ministers have went to jail. In Sweden, none of that is even considered, despite the fact that the level of corruption is similar. In Sweden, corrupt officials are rewarded, like the former Stockholm police chief who was reshuffled on a better position and her wage was doubled for two years. Such, as, such a system eventually has to bring the whole country down, because that's the insidious nature of corruption. Mass immigration has accelerated that because the pre-existent set of incentives set the stage for more ridiculous demands by corrupt officials, demands which, when put against economic reality, unavoidably run short of. And then there is the issue of the welfare state, specifically the Swedish model itself. The whole idea of modern Sweden is insane and has been insane right from the get-go, right from the 1950s when the construction of this mental asylum started. Anyone with two brain cells to rub together and some knowledge of basic economics would have been able to tell you that this will not end well. And it did not end well. In 1993, Sweden collapsed, and instead of abandoning socialism, the elite class just did some patchwork, essentially, and liberalized some uh, superficial markets like TV and radio. But the socialist ethos remained ingrained into the system. Mass immigration only accelerated what was already a foregone conclusion, namely that yet another collapse is due to come. Sure, mass immigration is a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is socialism. The very idea of the Swedish model is the problem. And as, the so -called, as long as the so-called Swedish model exists, there will always be problems. And it will only get a lot worse from now. 
and the way I know my Swedes, it's going to be a long time before it gets better, if it will ever get better. And I'm not holding my breath on that too much, but more on that uh, in uh, chapter 6. Until then, chapter 5, the troubles in exposing the truth. This is really a very short chapter, largely because it was summarized by Jan Hunneson on this channel two years and a half ago. The Swedes are the problem. It's really that simple. The majority of the Swedish public is demoralized in a Yuri Bezmenov sense. It doesn't matter how much evidence you show to them, they will not believe it. Or in the rare cases that they do believe it, they'll write it off as an isolated incident and refuse to internalize any serious analysis or at least entertain the more radical thoughts that maybe, just maybe, quite a few things are seriously rotten in Sverige. I mentioned in the first uh, chapter that two of the people who drew my attention to this topic insisted multiple times that I don't discuss their identities in the video because they could lose their jobs simply for sharing a link from the mainstream press with politically incorrect people such as myself. There is no policy or law uh, that forbids Swedes from sharing links from the mainstream press. You've seen it yourself and you can see it in the description box down below. Everything I said is backed up by stories published by the state media, municipal newspapers and Sweden's uh, Statistics Central Bureau. But even so, a lot of Swedes will instinctively dismiss you as a person as soon as they realize that the narrative leads towards a place outside of the accepted corridor of opinion. And this is amplified in the public sector, of course, where many have not only uh, the usual NPC outlook, but also have a very direct personal interest in keeping the truth from being exposed. Because, of course, once the truth gets out, uncomfortable questions become more acceptable and soon enough the question of personal culpability will emerge too. And no Swedish NPC wants to think of himself as having done anything wrong. Keep in mind that almost all atrocities in human history have been committed in the name of doing good. And the same is true here. The main characters in the story of destroying Sweden are firmly convinced that they are the good people and not the villains in the story. Also on this point, exposing the truth in itself leads to uncomfortable questions with equally uncomfortable answers. As I said earlier, the whole edifice of the Swedish model has to be helicoptered and it absolutely is the culprit. But nobody wants to think about that. These are people who are emotionally invested in the idea of the Swedish model functioning. So yeah, that's why anyone exposing the truth will get in trouble. Heck, I got into trouble for talking about uh, some of these things even though I'm not a Swedish citizen or a resident of Sweden. So I can only imagine the troubles one can get himself or herself into as a citizen. All right, chapter six, what's next and then what? Well, I kind of alluded uh, to that already uh, earlier when I said that a collapse is due to come and it won't be pretty. One consistent fact of Scandinavia is the gigantic household debt. Historically, Sweden was faring least bad of all, the, of all the Nordic countries, with Denmark being the worst, with the average household uh, holding more than 230% of its net worth in debt. As an overall uh, ratio to the GDP, Denmark is still number one in the world with uh, about 130% household debt to GDP ratio. Household debt is important because it is separate from government debt. When the two are combined, that is to say that both the government and the population is fiscally irresponsible, that's when things can go really wrong unless you're China or the United States, that is to say world-class currency manipulators. And such is the case with Sweden, not a world-class currency manipula manipulator and both the government and the population deeply in the hole. While I explained the most of this video how the government is in deep trouble, even though for now the whole scheme of hiding the debt has kept international attention away from them, the population is not exactly better. 
the household debt levels have been growing at a rapid pace in the last 10 years. At the beginning of 2019, total household debt was uh, at uh, 4,012 billion kroner. The GDP of Sweden in 2018 was 4,700 billion kroner. So around 85% of the GDP, give or take, something in that ballpark for sure. Now, a recession is coming. Sure, not the fault of Sweden, but the fault of Germany. Yet the impact of that recession in Sweden will be the fault of Sweden. The GDP of Sweden is about the same as the GDP of Poland in nominal dollars, but already lower in purchase power parity terms. Who wants to guess what's going to happen when the recession hits? <laughs> Let me put it this way. The Poles, and I'm using Poland as an example because their GDP is essentially identical. So the Poles have a household debt to GDP ratio that is almost a third of Sweden's. In other words, if recession hits, the Poles don't have to starve just to pay debt. If you're smart, you go out in the market and bet against the Swedish Kruna and in favor of the Polish Zwoty. Or even better, in favor of the US dollar and against both the Euro currency and the Swedish Kruna, both being essentially shit-tier currencies. And Sweden being one of the shit-tier stocks available on the market that needs to be swept away for a profit. Harsh? Yes. But I didn't make this mess. I'm merely suggesting ways for you to make money off of this mess. But this doesn't stop here. Everyone, native and recent immigrants, or new svenskar as the propaganda calls them, everyone will necessarily suffer quite a lot. Most of the wealth of private citizens is in real estate, and the real estate market in Sweden is one of the most distorted ones in the world, largely due to excessive regulation, rent control, and yes, mass unrestricted immigration. When a recession hits, the first ones affected are those with assets in real estate. This will not go down well. No matter how you look at it, most inhabitants of Sweden will have to become poorer in the next five years. And there's not much that can be done about it, not realistically anyway. And with that, let's look a bit uh, at what can be done. Chapter 7, Identifying Potential Remedies. Well, as I said, realistically, there's not much that can be done. In theory, yes, this can be fixed using a shock therapy, a la Leszek Balcerovic in the early 1990s in Poland. But this won't fly in Sweden politically because nobody, no, not even the far right, is economically literate enough to even propose such a thing. Realistically, half of the services will have to be cut and the size and scope of the government will have to necessarily shrink. But again, this is unpopular. To make things worse, the population makes it impossible for a political force to win elections and implement at least some of the measures that the Danes have implemented, namely deportations by the thousands, asset confiscation from illegal immigrants to pay for their upkeep, and mandatory courses on Danish culture, Jesus, Christianity, Danish con conduct, the Danish way of life, and the shunning of anything non-Danish from public life. They, those are policies I would deem a good start but still not enough. But even that is far from ever happening in Sweden. I mean, most Swedes seriously believe that there is nothing Swedish specific and that everything nice in Sweden has been brought or built by the immigrants. With such a population, is it really worth even trying? Perhaps the remedy does indeed reside in the complete demographic shift. Just two weeks ago, SVT said that 19.1% of the population of Sweden is born outside of the country. The most numerous group is born in Syria. The second most numerous is born in Iraq. Finnish Swedes are only the third most numerous, but they're also old and dying out. This paints a pretty bleak picture. Not only is Sweden bankrupt economically, a fact which I will consider from now on thoroughly established, but it's also bankrupt demographically, 
culturally and civilizationally. In other words, Sweden is dead. They just don't know it yet. Can this be turned around? Yes, but the price in blood, sweat and tears has just gone up a little bit. Well, actually by quite a lot. <laughs> by such a huge margin that I have a hard time even attempting to make the argument that it's worth bothering. So the remedies will have to be individual. Buy US dollars. If you own assets in Sweden, sell as much as possible. And if you don't want to leave the country, sit on the cash until the recession hits. You'll be able to buy a lot of nice property for a fraction of its current price. Those of you of immigrant background and not idiots should consider moving out like my friend born in Molno, Adam Starzynski did. He moved to Poland, a country he did not know as a child. His parents might have thought he was nuts at first, but now it was clearly the right move. I sure appreciate it because I have a much easier uh, task visiting Adam in Warszawa rather than uh, in uh, Molno. <laughs> but no, seriously. <clears throat> If you can get a second passport, do that and start preparing for evacuation. The place will get pretty bad. Oh, and don't listen to me and, um, or you know, you still have the option. Don't listen to me and continue to hope for the best. After all, hey, what do I know? And finally, chapter eight, conclusions. Ultimately, any story based on fiction and make-believe narratives, like the story of modern Sweden is, has to have an end. Yes, the end won't be pretty, but the end is mandatory. Because economics is for everyone, not just for conservatives and libertarians. And what cannot go on will not go on, regardless of your opinion about it. The paradise of Sweden will come to an end. How the end will look like still depends on its people. Managed decline is still possible, and the preservation of some of its qualities in the hope that they can be made great again by the next generation is also possible. All of that is up to the people currently living in Sweden. And whatever they decide by action, not by blog posts or puffing speeches in the Riksdag, whatever they decide, that will shape the outcome. 20 years from now. I don't pretend to know how that will look like. Heck, nobody can know that. What I do pretend to know is that the decline is coming and the lies Sweden has been telling both to itself and to the world at large will unravel in the next five years with a vicious fury. Just like the lies Greece has been telling to itself and to the world unraveled in 2009. You can kick the can down the road for a while, but eventually the check does arrive and the party is over. It's just how reality works. Nothing personal, no hate, just facts. And the fact that Sweden is bankrupt will have to make its way through the decision-making process, both in the country and in Europe in general. Hundreds of thousands of far leftists worldwide will be sad for sure, but they'll be fine eventually. And Sweden will join all the other failed socialists experiments. The end. Svršit. Kanjec filma. Schlut. <laughs> all right. And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continuous and generous support. Please do consider a donation should you derive any value from the work being done here. Don't forget to subscribe, visit our website and I will see you all soon on The Freedom Alternative.